baseball. There isn't any baseball or football today, at least not at this time. There will be later on at about, well, just about two hours from now, actually one hour and 54 minutes from now at 2.20. But until then, it is me. The best thing that can be said about a Saturday morning talk show, or even a Saturday afternoon talk show, is that it's a public service to help kill time until the football game starts. Here it is, 17 years I have been in this business now. 17 years, pulled big numbers, the whole bit, and now I'm just fill time until the football game starts. You know, in between the Star, Tech, Star Trek trivia and the football game, it's me. And what am I faced with today? I'm faced with one of the most glorious, beautiful days you will ever find. I mean, a fantastic day in Florida. And I'm sitting here playing to people who aren't swift enough to go outside and enjoy the weather. Okay, well, you know, you do what you can do. You know, for years, for years, talk shows have pandered to the available audience on Saturday. You know, things like, hello, doctor, doctor, I got a pain in my side. My doctor says it could be nothing, but it could be something. What do you think, doctor? Should I believe him, doctor? <sighs> and now, now the industry, after 38 years or whatever it is of driving away the audience on Saturdays, have turned to me. 38 years of destruction of talk radio on the weekends, and now they turn to me and say, uh, Lassiter, uh, you know, go in and do two hours and 20 minutes on Saturday. <laughs> oh, my God. <sighs> now, granted, I will admit to you that from time to time, there, there are guys trying to break into the business, new guys who will work on weekends, and they will spend an entire week trying to come up with a provocative, regular talk show. They'll work their hearts out. But I work my heart out Monday through Friday. Four hours a day, that's 20 hours a week of talk. And you're sitting there waiting for me. You're sitting there saying, gee, let's wait for him to start the talk show. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I mean, I just, you know, gave you 12, 13 minutes of chortles, you know. Hey, that's as far as I go. The rest is up to you. I've done, I have done so much for you people. You don't understand what I have done, how I have altered my life all for you. For example, I now go to the Kmart. Not because I want to go to the Kmart, but just so I can see where it is that you go. So I, I can have some type, of, some type of understanding as to what it is that you're faced with, what you go through with your lives. I've even started driving a, a U.S.-made car. Why? For you, that's why. I eat out at cheap restaurants so that I can identify with the kind of food that you eat. I've done all of this for you, and you sit back on Saturday afternoon and say, Well, we'll wait to see what he wants to talk about. Last time I tried this, what did it get me? It got me a, a fascinating discussion on the history of turpentine. Well, I don't care. I don't care. I'll just give you the telephone numbers. Nine nine zeros. I got kind of a problem. I'd like to run by you, see what you think. Okay. Uh, I'd like to meet a girl. Okay. Okay. And uh, I think you're. In, you, I, th this isn't desperate and dateless. Well, I know, but I just thought I'd get your opinion on it. In that, to me, you know, age, race, or physical appearance isn't important. Okay. And I've tried to hang around. You're just horny. You don't care. Mars and computer user groups, but mm -hmm. just not doing it. You sound to me like you know, like you're trying to copy Delmer's uh, shtick. Uh, you're, you're just a horny man, right, Ray? Yeah. Just yeah. a horny. Anything will do. Yeah, basically. <laughs> well, Ray, I'll tell you what. I'll put you back on hold. If anybody out there, I've got two lines open, one in each county. If anybody out there wants to meet you, then we'll put the two of you together on the air, okay? Okay, this is a desperate situation, Bob, and I'm beholden to you, sir. Okay, so we'll just put Ray back on hold. There we go with Ray. And it's, uh, what, 1242? We'll take a break and return. I'm Tom said he's horny. He's trying to meet a woman. We'll do anything on Saturday. We have no shame whatsoever. So if there are any women out there that want to meet horny Tom, he says age, race, sex, physical appearance has nothing to do with anything whatsoever. He is not picky at this point in the game. That's Tom, but I assume he's willing to travel. So even if you're in Pinellas, uh, probably you could work something out with Tom. Didn't sound like an overly exciting man, but then who am I to say? Really? Yeah. Well, how's that, Tom? Well, I'm on the road 14 hours a day, five uh -huh. days a week. Uh-huh. And I listen to your show, and I get upset, and I can't call you. Mm-hmm. And you've got me so damned addicted to radio that I can't go out and mow my lawn today because i got to find out what the hell's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think it's all your fault. My fault, Tom. Yes, I'm about to start 
Lasseter Anonymous Club. Tom, 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 you wouldn't want to do that. us people who are addicted to you can get something done. You know, we used to be able to get something done on the weekend. Now i got to spend three hours in the house this afternoon listening to you so I can get upset. Well, Tom, you know, you, you can you can do your chores at 2.20. I, football game comes on at 2.20. Yeah, I, I, I want to watch the football game and listen to it. I mean, I can't. I, I, I'm not ambidextrous. I'm deaf in one ear. No. Yeah. Oh, Tom. And your comment yesterday about those snowbirds. Uh, I think what we ought to do is we ought to say anybody who comes to Florida after the age of 60, if they can't have a Florida driver's license, and they can't use driver's license from the state they came from, then we wouldn't have to have a metro. We wouldn't have to spend all this money on these roads because the people who live here would be the only ones on the road. Well, but, 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 Tom, the reason we might want to spend some money on roads is so that we could get from one place to another. Yeah, but... It's not really just to accommodate brain-damaged snowbirds. It's so that, you know, you can get from St. Petersburg to, let's say, Lutz without having to go to Jacksonville first. Yeah, but we, we, the roads we have now would be sufficient for the end of time if we took all the snowbirds off the road. But, 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 Tom, you see, you, you live in Hillsborough County where the roads are a tad better. In Pinellas County, there are only three roads, Tom. I-275. It's not as easy as it seems, is it, Tom? It's just It's tough getting rid of those people. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's probably easier easy. to get rid of the love bugs than it is to get rid of the brain-damaged snowbirds. Well, I do my, I I do my best. Golf carts and I do my best, Tom, to get rid of love bugs. I just drive up and down the streets, you know, squishing them on my windshield and, and front bumper, and I would be willing to do the same thing for the brain-damaged snowbirds. Be good. Be good. Bob, and he's... Bob, she's in the back bedroom with the radio on. Oh, the the, the brain-damaged snowbird, uh, snowbird alarm, you mean? Right, right. Or when we get one on the uh, air? Will it go something like... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in re reference to that man that just called Tom... Uh, Tom? Uh-huh. Obviously, he's never been over to St. Petersburg and seen the three-wheel bicycle running up and down the main streets over there. Get well, right. well, apparently he has. He's worried about it happening over in Hillsboro. Mm. Well, I mean, I know from personal experience where they've come out of the corners on me and thing like that, and it was strictly a white knuckle trip. I was over there nine years ago and haven't been back. You know, you know, of course, if Gucci ever put out a tricycle, they'd be all over Carol Wood in no time. I tell a Canadian can leave Canada with $100 and go back with $99.95. I don't believe that either. They're decent people. It's 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 obviously you the convenience bet? store people that are bringing these quarters down in huge, huge bags and passing them off on to you and I so that we will think it is the Canadian tourists doing it. So let me put you on hold and I'll come back and answer it after the news. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Uh-huh. All right. What time do you need me out? Uh, talk to me on my, my phones here. What time do you need me out? So I'm used to... Oh, oh, okay, because I was used to getting out 20 seconds uh, before that. No problem, no problem at all. It's just, you know, we, as long as we each know what we're talking about, then we can say, see you later. Here. Interested in, but I feel compelled to, to help young people out of this dilemma. Kevin, you're still there? Yep. Okay, Kevin, first of all, why in God's name would you want to get into radio? I enjoy it. You enjoy, I enjoy it. listening to it, and I would like to be a part of it. Big difference between listening to it and working at it. Kevin, oh, do you I like that. do you like job security? Not really. Well, then maybe you have a maybe you you have what it takes. Okay, you said how do you get into it? Well, first of all, the best way to do it is in the music end of the business. Mm -hmm. Now, most people will tell you to go to a small market. I say Balderdash. You know, if, if you want to start, if. It's tough to get out of a small market. Once you get into a small market, then people say, Oh, God, he works in Appalachia Cola. Oh, there must be a reason. No, start right here. Start in a bigger market. But I feel it's just really taking me nowhere. Sounds now, to me like you already work in radio. <laughs> they, oh, what the hell, let's give him a shot. That's the way it works. But, Kevin, I'm going to warn you in advance. There are two terrible things that happen in your life when you work in broadcasting. I'm as serious as I can be. First of all, you are spoiled forever from going out and earning a living. What do you mean? <laughs> I don't understand. Kevin, I, I get paid a damned reasonable amount of money to sit here for four hours a day, be either serious or silly. 27 cents a call. 27 cents a call, that's right. To be either serious or silly or whatever. Okay? Four hours a day. Now, granted, I have to read a lot and I have to think a lot and I have to observe a lot, but I do this anyway. It's just the type of person I am. But four hours a day, Kevin, and I, you know, nobody, 
Nobody bitches and moans more about his gig than I do. I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the things that I find to be just intolerable. I can't work. The coffee doesn't please me. Oh, you know, ah. Oh. <laughs> but nonetheless, I really appreciate it. It is a piece of cake. It is a piece of cake. If I had to go out tomorrow and sell shoes or dig ditches or become a, a plumber's apprentice, it would kill me, Kevin. It would kill me. It would kill me not only physically, but it would also kill me emotionally. Really? That's problem number one. Problem number two is once you have worked in this business for any length of time, it becomes very difficult to get out of it. Well, I wouldn't want to. Well, well don't be so sure about that. Well, maybe that's true. Kevin, you hear about people that make fabulous money in radio, and it's true. Because they're very popular. But you're talking about 2%. Yeah. Most Larry of the King. people who work in radio work for peanuts, man, just to be there. And the problem is, if you're stuck in this business, let's say, for 10 years, you get into it when you're relatively young, and you're here for 10 years, and you, you never quite make it. You never really break into the big time. And, you know, even people who work at big stations are not necessarily earning big money. Uh -huh. But let's say after 10 years, you're, you're just not doing all that well, and the time comes, you realize that, well, I'm not going to make it, and maybe I better look for something else. You know, you can't play rock and roll records forever. Uh, if you want a real good indication as to what this business is like, go out of your way and find an old Harry Chapin record called W-O-L-D. Uh, mm -hmm. It brings tears to the eyes of anyone who has been in this business for more than five years, because it's true. But nonetheless, the ten years come, now you've got yourself a wife and a family, and, and you want to buy a house, and so forth and so on, and you realize that you're not going to be able to do that on what they're paying and in most radio gigs, and so you go out and you start to apply for other work, and you're filling out the application, and it comes time to put down your past experience. Mm -hmm. Most people are going to be like you, Kevin, and they're going to assume that working in radio is just fantastic. Well, I don't say that. Well, I, hear me I, out. I, I think I would enjoy it. Hear me out, Kevin. Most people consider this to be show business and magic. So they're going to look and see that, uh-oh, Kevin has worked for 10 years in radio. Why in God's name does he now suddenly want to become an insurance salesman? Now nah, he must just be in between jobs. Somebody that has had the glamour and the excitement of working in radio is not going to be happy selling insurance. And so, Kevin, you then put yourself in a miserable box. You can't get out of it. Hmm. So make real, real sure that not only do you want to do it, but you also have to be blunt and honest and brutally honest with yourself. Are you going to be able to make it? Just getting a job does not mean you're going to make it. Oh, I realize that. That, that, that. It's a chance like everything's a chance. And then you work, and even if you do make it, you come in one day and you find out that the station has been sold or the owner had a change of heart, and instead of playing uh, records, now they're going to do uh, you know, 24 hours of weather and there's just no place in the format for you and you're just out in the street. And, you know, you say you might want to do talk radio. I will assume, because you listen to my show, that you might want to do the kind of show that I do, right? Well, not, well I'm not going to be as... I don't want to say callous, but there's, I, there, I feel there's maybe a little more tact that could be done. But would you like to do? Your fault. Would you like to do tough, issue-oriented radio where you give your opinion and you, you yes. sometimes argue and disagree with people? Yes. Kevin, you're talking about less than 50 jobs in the entire country. Oh, way of getting people to open up to expose them, or exactly, Kevin, it's an act. That's what I'm, you know, and people... I, w everything I say, I believe. Oh, I realize that. But Kevin, I am one of the most mild-mannered, polite people that you can begin to imagine. Well, that's, I, I wish I knew you personally, because I think, we'd, frankly, we'd get along, but... I never scream, I never raise... Okay, I take that back. Once you, every... You don't have to. You get it well, all over the radio, and then you go home, and you're probably... Well, it doesn't make any difference. Once every three months, I throw a temper tantrum, the likes of which you cannot begin to imagine. I have to do it. Because otherwise, people step all over me. I'm really a very mild-mannered man. And every three months, I throw a vicious temper tantrum. I mean, I'm talking about throwing furniture. I'm talking about screaming at the top of my lungs, and I am really loud, Kevin. And I have <laughs> to do that once every three months to keep I my get. employer in line. You should ask my wife how I get. One more thing, and I'll let you go. Sure, what's I know what's you that? probably have a whole board light up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I Virginia, it was you me. And, uh, Ted's on. Then if I can find somebody interesting on the other station, more interesting than uh, what you have on, then I'll listen to that. And can you really hear some 
funny stuff going on. It is out of this world. But I tell you what, none of them can do the things you do. How you sit there and make all those little whacking noises. Excuse me, I have to shut off the water. Around and, you and Kevin, get her. Consider a gig as a sanitation engineer first. But none of I mean, no stuff wrong, please. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they start throwing it. These things, they come from everywhere. We do, they're very cheap. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll, make, we'll cut a deal with you. You live in Holland, and uh, you, what's the matter with people from New Jersey? They're terrible drivers. Get off my back. Aeronauts are fantastic <laughs> drivers. New Jersey has one of the most advanced highway systems in the entire nation. They're terrible. They drive like they are. Nah, it's the people from Philadelphia. They're the bad drivers. No, 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 no. It's the ones from Jersey. It is not. Everybody <laughs> from New Jersey knows that New Jersey drivers are good drivers. The Philadelphia drivers no, are the ones that no, can't that handle God, it. That Garden State is the worst. And it I, is and not. I, it's I, a I marvelous place. I consider myself a pretty good driver because I drove a cab in New York City. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, right. Yeah, sure, lady. You know how to drive, right? I do. Uh huh. Honk, honk. Honk, honk, honk. Well, isn't that People from of... New York City think the car doesn't go in forward unless you have the horn depressed right. at the that's same the time. That's the best part of the car, the horn. No. Oh, <laughs> what would you know about driving? Bob, have a good I've time. I've already pointed out to you how many times do I have to say it in Vanilla's UFLA. Charlie in West Tampa. Hi, Charlie. You're on the air. How you doing, Bob? Fine, Charlie. Happy birthday. Thank you. A little belated, but uh, uh, not much. I want to call somebody a sleazebag, Bob. Hey, fine with me. Jim Baker. Big sleazebag. A smart sleazebag, too. Yes, sir. Uh, I just can't. It's just. He, he's, he's, he's sick. He's sick. He's, he's fooled everybody too long. It's, and now they got a phone line, Bob, to uh, suck some more money out of the public. Oh, I, you know, uh, Charlie, on that one, I disagree with you. That, I believe, is a stroke of genius. I am so envious of the Bakers for having thought of that and, not, you know, my not thinking of it. That's a stroke of genius, my man. It is a stroke of genius, but it's, Bob, it's just, it's ridiculous that they have to uh, depend on the public. You know, what's, what's next? Tammy Baker, you know, Cosmetics, they're going to have a blush with a paint roller or something, you know, it's, it's just... Whoa, whoa, Charlie, where have you been? Tammy Baker Cosmetics have been around for years. Right, well... They're very expensive. I know, I know, Bob, it's just, it's just kind of, it's just, that whole thing is weird, but, um, by the way, um, I wanted to, uh, say good luck to to the Tigers today. I'm a Tigers fan, and uh, I'm real excited about today's game and stuff. So, and uh, did you hear about Rocky? About Rocky? Yeah, uh, about, about his, Rocky. His little. <laughs> I heard him the other night on another station, and he he's uh, revealed some pretty weird stuff, Bob. Like what? Like uh, he's building a dungeon in his house, so uh, him and his wife can so he can wear a suit of armor. And uh, tie his wife up and... Uh, oh, sounds exciting. Yeah, and he's going to have a mock funeral. Wouldn't you love to see Mrs. Rocky someday? <laughs> you know, maybe Playboy could do a, an in-depth interview and a, a, a spread with Mrs. Rocky. <laughs> well, That'd be great. I'd buy that issue. Supposedly, she loves for him to tie her up to a, his car and, and him beat her with a whip and stuff. She loves it. Oh, my, my, my. But, but, but Rocky said he, he, doesn't, he doesn't hurt her. He doesn't hurt her. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> Are you? He, he, he uh, stressed mm -hmm. that fact, Bob. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he's a mild-mannered man. Right. But uh, is he going to be in the studio Friday? No, not in studio. He'll be on the phone. Really? You're talking about the Lassiter Group, which comes up this Friday, October the 9th, 12 noon, Lionel, Carol, and Rocky, and Captain Jackie. Can't wait, Bob. Either can I. It's either going to be a disaster or radio history, and I'm not sure which. Well, it'll be it'll be uh, enjoyable anyway. Guess what i seen, Bob? i seen the condom mobile. A condom mobile? Yeah, Jim over in Clearwater. The oh, the old Oscar Mayer weenie mobile, I, yeah. I passed by Winky Wieners, and there it was. Son of a gun. And he was heading for a phone booth, too, so I don't, I don't know. Oh, he should be calling in any minute, then. Okay, well, I'll let you go, Bob. i got to get ready to watch the game. But I wanted to make somebody else a sleazebag, too. Uh, Shanks. Shanks. Shanks is a sleazebag. The queen of talk radio. He, he, he spends uh, five minutes saying how he doesn't want to criticize anybody, then spends ten more telling why. Son of a gun. So, anyways, Bob, the comic strips are on the way. Entertainment. Okay. See you later, bud. Have a good day. Bye-bye, Charlie. Happy oh. birthday, and I'd like to wish you continued good health and success in whatever you do. Thank you. But I feel that but. you're always criticizing the elderly from the Midwest. And, yes, yes. And it just seems that you're using a stereotype, Mr. Lasseter. I think we should judge people individually on an individual basis. Well, yes, we should, but we can also judge people on the other on the masses of, of them staring us in the face out there. Well, I mean, perhaps some of them have not all their faculties, but I mean, they are elderly people, 
And when we, and some, a lot of people are unfortunate that when they get older, they do lose their capacities. Or down here because there is a mentality like they hate the northerners and now you're talking about the midwestern states like iowa well these people you know if these fat women would stop walking around in yellow stretch pants with socks and sandals on and you know we wouldn't talk about them well mr lester i mean that is a stereotype not all of them what do you mean a stereotype i mean there are thousands of them out there and with each passing day more of them are rushing into town hanging around kmarts well stealing sugar from the restaurants well, I don't approve of that. Of course they should pay their way. I think anyone should. The working people deserve tips and things like that. I, but I do like you, Mr. Lassiter, and I will continue to listen to your show, but I just wish you had more optimism in your life. I think you're a fine man. More optimism? I, you always seem to be so Don't get numbers by being optimistic, lady. Well, I mean, you always seem to be so pessimistic about everything, Mr. Lassiter. Right, that's what gets the numbers. Well... I try to be more optimistic and happier. I like you, and thank you for letting me talk. Take care. Optimistic and happier. Good grief. Oh, phooey. Jim in Largo. Hi there, Jim. Hey, how you doing there, Bob? Fine. Yeah, I'm over at the hot dog stand. Over at the hot dog stand again, huh? Well, I, I, uh, I was going to fill up on a few over here, so I figured I'd probably get a few minutes before they chase me away. Mm -hmm. So what's going on, Bob? Oh, not much, uh, Jim. Uh, how about yourself? Well, I kind of tuned in on the uh, old uh, condom mobile there. Yeah. And I heard you talking about the Baker deal. Yeah, did you hear about uh, Ronnie's uh, kid going to be on television putting uh, rubbers on bananas? Oh, jeez. That should be good. I hope they're... Well, I'm kind of looking forward well, to it. I hope they're our brand. Well, you know, whatever brand it is, it doesn't really make that much difference. It, it should still help the industry overall, I oh, should yeah, think, wouldn't really. you? Unfortunately, the banana industry is very, very distraught about this. Hey, you know, uh, kind of uh, got me thinking when we're talking about the Baker deal. I'll tell you something that really put that to shame. You're wondering how they go about uh, trying the new uh, condom lines and whatnot to see if they work. Uh -huh. You ever wonder how they go about that? Uh, to tell you the truth, Jim, no, I never did wonder about that. I have so many things that I wonder yet, I guess. Yeah, the, uh, all the corporate guys and chairman of the boards there, uh, well... I don't know if I should say this or not. But anyway, they uh, they get together with their uh, secretaries and they uh, try out the new lines. Oh, really? Yeah, that's how, that's how they find out the product is good or not. How do you think they test them out? Well, maybe that's they, why the you know, administration they, they show you on TV, the they blow them up with air, you know. But uh, well, I said maybe that's why the administration has sent out the president's son to uh, <clears throat> teach people how to uh, put condoms on bananas. Hey, now let me tell you something. Those boys can hold some good orgies. The uh, guys of these. Uh, corporate guys that run the uh, condom manufacturing plants? Well, I'm sure they can. I'm not so sure about people in the administration, you know, running around putting condoms on bananas. Oh, yeah. They, uh, well, I'll tell you, they try out all these, all the new stuff. I, I like to be there when they come out with the new, uh, the new one I was telling you about. It's good. I mean, who the hell are they trying to kid? Huh? I ought to be putting them on squash. Yeah. Can't wait till they come out with the, the new deal there. I like to be a fly on the wall when they do that. Oh, really? When they, uh, when they impregnate the uh, latex with that new chemical that uh, kind of gives, they're really supposed to give, make women horny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, boy, I'll tell you. Well, it should do much for the industry. Huh? Uh, it should, I try to read my lips, Jim. It should do much for the industry. Oh, I, I'll tell you what, uh, it's... Why don't you look for a phone booth that's not on a you know a busy highway so that you could hear what I was saying in return? Well, hey, I'm just going to go over here and eat. They do have great uh, Chicago hot dogs over here. Oh. Yeah. So, uh... Well, I don't want to keep you from your lunch, Jim. Well, that's all right. I'm just kind of working up an appetite here. Well, good. Why don't you go and diminish it there? WFLA. Hey, Roberto. How are you this afternoon? Fine, Michael. Oh, good to hear. Listen, the reason I wanted to call in, the, uh, a couple callers ago, the guy was telling you about what Rocky did. Mm -hmm. And the reason I called you was, was to verify it. They had, right. they had a show on s and m and he called in... And I, I was thinking whoa, to myself... Whoa, 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 whoa. Mr. Entertainment had a show on sadomasochism? Right. Hey, you're not out there. Listen, mm -hmm. you ran a poll a couple of Saturdays ago. I'll get into the S&M. You ran a poll. Was he, was he in favor of it or opposed to it? Or, or just neutral? Well, he, Mr. He, he, he was a moderator. He, he laid in the cut and, and sat back and, and kicked with it. And he had a little fun with it. And he had a few of the Christians call in. And he had a few of the folks in, in the neighborhood that are into it call in. And, and I got to admit, it's entertaining. 
But you were you were running a poll not too long ago, and I couldn't get through the lines, and I had a comment I wanted to make. What was that? The man had his socks on, but he'll never feel Lassiter's shoes out there for the late-night rattlesnake hunter. Well, I've heard that he always had his socks on. Uh, let me, I, he, the, he'll never feel the shoes. I'll tell you what, Bob. We miss you at night out there, and I know you don't like to do it. You like to be with your Lady Mary like I'm with my Lady Dawn, and it, it's it's. I know you're in a time spot now that's comfortable and feeling good to you. And it sounds like strange things are happening over there at the other station, but I got my two guys back-to-back, the Webb and you, and I know the Webb. What do you mean strange things are happening over there? Like what? Uh, this morning, uh, Dawn does see, Dawn thinks I'm crazy because I got off the television and got into talk radio, and if you ever start a fan club, I want to be the president. Uh, you've made, well, I told you before, you've made me laugh, you've made me cry, you've given me many, many hours of well, we are kicking, time entertainment. We are kicking around the idea of a Lassiter fan club over here, uh, putting out uh, pictures uh, on dartboards and things of that nature. We are legitimately kicking that around, and we'll probably go ahead and do hey, it. Hey, it sounds good. In fact, if you'd have ever said, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to appear or be at some type of radio promotion, because I, my lady and I do some radio promotions and TV promotions from time to time. Uh, and if, if you think I'm kidding or I'm not for real, Ted Webb knows us. We come in and, and do a little time with him every now and then. We handle rattlesnakes, cotton mouths. Uh, we deal in all types of urban wildlife problems. But anyway, uh, if you ever had a fan club, uh, there's definitely the, the security people, the people in the bowling alleys that we know, and I'm not a sportsman. I wouldn't turn a TV set on to watch a buck, a bandit, or anybody. To me, games are funny. I've only ever participated in two types of competition sports in my life, and that's sports parachuting and rattlesnake roundups. I like to be on the edge. All that other stuff is just games to me. Well, I return John there, Michael. Bob, I just want to call in and tell you, the only person that could ever get out of Rocky, and and you never had to pull for it. You could just agitate him a little bit. And, in fact, when Lassiter Friday is something in my household, and I know about 100 households and people that we know and we're, are, are waiting with bated breath <laughs> to see what happens. The uh, Lassiter group. Right. High noon or low noon, you know, whichever. Uh, we'll be there on top of it. You, we're in and out of the truck that time of the day because we're answering calls, getting coons out of attics, and and but uh, we're, we're like I say, we're we're waiting for it. We know it's going to be like you said. It is a, either going to be one of the it's going to bomb I, to be or, honest, or be great. I don't great. think you like Lionel, but I like Lionel. I like the man knows how to play with words. He knows how to deal with it. Uh, Lionel's cute. I can deal with Lionel, but Rocky. Rocky would be strange. I think I could meet him one night and party with him one night, but I would never want to go back for seconds, if you know what I mean. Thank you, Michael. All right, later, Bob. Take care. Hi, boys and girls, and welcome to Tot Talk, the telephone talk show for little people, with your host, me, Uncle Bob. We have a great show planned for you this afternoon. A little bit later on, we'll be talking about how to organize a neighborhood game of hide-and-go-seek. And then, we'll be discussing the new format for Jack and Jill magazine. And finally, in the last portion of the program, we have an exciting interview with the author of the revised Boy Scout Handbook Manual. But first, I want to give you some helpful hints for buying Christmas presents for Mommy and Daddy. So, all of you big boys and big girls, all of you moms and dads, We'll have to leave the room for just a few minutes as we talk about how to buy Christmas presents for Mommy and Daddy. You know, boys and girls, shoo, shoo all of you big people. You know, boys and girls, most daddies like things like socks and ties and scarves and... Are they gone? Okay. We'll pick up where we left off last week with the Jessica Hahn interview. Page 178. <clears throat> this is Jessica talking. I wasn't feeling good, and I didn't care that I wasn't feeling good. It was like it didn't matter. So the conversation goes on about Tammy and Jim and their marriage problems and how he needs a woman to help him. Jessica, he said to me, if I don't get this help, I feel like I'll lose everything. And John Fletcher said, Jessica, 
you're going to be doing something tremendous for God. John got up and said, I'll be right back. He left. Jim Baker started talking more and more, telling me the same thing. Within minutes, John came running back into the room with a bottle of Vaseline Intensive Care Lotion, and he says, Jim Baker loves back rubs. I said, John, I don't think so. I felt sick. I, I could barely talk. He then leaves the room. So now I'm sitting here. Jim Baker is on the bed. He gets up. He's still complaining that he's not going to be able to go on. He doesn't want to live. He doesn't want to continue. It's so hard to continue in his ministry. And then he says to me, I'm glad you came. I said, I really, I, I don't feel right. And I kept trying to say that. But I couldn't even respond to what he was saying anymore. I couldn't anymore. So Jim Baker takes me. He gets up off the edge of the bed. He takes off his bathing suit, just undresses. He slips off the thing. Playboy, what were you doing then, Han? I'm sitting. I said to him, what are you doing? I told him I had never been with a man. He said, I know. Playboy, he knew you were a virgin, Han. Yes. And I said, why don't you just hire somebody? He said, you can't trust everybody. I kept pushing him away. I asked him, what makes you think that you can trust me? And he said, because I know about you. I know what your life is about. You won't hurt me like the others. You're here to help me, and by helping me, you're going to help a lot of people. Playboy. This is after he has taken off his swimsuit? Han. Yeah. So he pulls off the bedspread, first thing. After he does that, he says, I hate bedspreads. Then he turns to me. I had on a plum dress, and it was a wraparound with a sash and untied. Playboy. Was it a sexy dress? Han. I didn't own many dresses. That was my prettiest. My pastor's wife bought it for me, and I had worn it at church, sitting up front. Playboy. Oh, Han. So he just pulls me, just takes my waist and turns me to face him. And he backs up on the bed and pulls me, and as he's going back, I'm pulling away, and the guy pulls my sash, takes my dress off. He starts, he, he unhooks my bra. You know, he just, he, he just undresses me. Playboy. And you're just standing there? Han. No, I'm... I'm not standing there. I'm lying there. And by the time he gets, he had my bra. He had my dress. He had my slip. He starts going on, and I'm just, I'm trying to take his hand, and I'm just saying, just, I, I said to him, you have to leave. He goes, Jessica, by helping the shepherd, you're helping the sheep. So I took his hand, and I said, Jim, I just can't. I kept pushing him, and, and the more I pushed, the more it enticed him, or whatever it did. So I just said to him, look, I'm sick. He said, you'll be fine. Just, just lie here. Playboy, did you say anything to him about the effects of the wine? Han, I said to him, there's something bad. There's something wrong with me. And he said, it's probably because you didn't eat. And that's all I said. Playboy, what happened next? Han, by now the guy is on top. He has managed to completely undress me. And he's sitting on my chest. And he's starting to put pillows underneath my back. He's really, he's really pushing himself. I mean, the guy was forcing himself. He, he put his <clears throat> in my mouth. And I just started to cry at that point because I couldn't believe. I just, I just started to realize everything that was happening. First of all, I couldn't breathe right. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was just emotionally, I couldn't. Everything was like, it was the first thing this man did. <sighs> he has pillows under me. He's sitting like on my neck. I'm not breathing. I'm feeling sick. The guy is like letting loose and I'm choking. Okay, so I'm crying. Tears are coming. Playboy. What do you mean? He, he was letting loose. Han. The guy <clears throat> in my mouth. There's tears rolling down my face. Okay, I'm limp as can be and he's still going on. In other words, he, he's, not, he's not seeing me respond. At this point, you just don't feel any. There, there's nothing left. So the guy moves down and he sees that I'm crying. I'm not in my right mind now. My neck hurts. My throat hurts. My head feels like it's going to explode. But he's frustrated and determined. Determined enough that within minutes he <clears throat> me. And on top, and he's holding my arms. And he, he has these pillows underneath me so that he's just into this. He's <clears throat> now and, and going on. I'm pushing him away. You know, every time I did that, it seemed to, to bring him on more. And he was, he was talking off the wall. Playboy. Saying what? Han. Saying, when you help the shepherd, you're helping the sheep. Crazy stuff. Playboy, what stuff? Han. 
You'll appreciate this later, that kind of stuff. He keeps holding my arms, and this is going on, and I start crying again, and then he... <clears throat> inside me. There was no reason to hold my arms, because it, it wasn't going anywhere. I, I felt like I was drifting. Playboy, did you feel pain? Han, yes, it hurt. But he wouldn't have stopped if I screamed. There was pain. There, there was a lot of pain, but I was worried. I kept saying, my God, I'm, I'm going to get pregnant. You have to understand, it wasn't like I ever did this. I, I had never slept with anybody. So this, to me, was a, a typical fear of someone who, who hasn't done it before. It's, it's like when you try to sleep or something, and you have a thought that keeps staying in your mind, and, and when you're tired, you can't get rid of the thought. And this was in my mind, that I, I was going to get pregnant. But I kept going and going. I was... It's not that... It's not that he couldn't do much. I mean, there, w there was no way. He, he went limp as can be, but he just kept trying, and it was frustrating him even more. You know, he, he, he turned me over. He tried anything. He was still having intercourse with me, but he couldn't really. Playboy, by this time, you had been there, what, about an hour, an hour and a half, more? Han, more. Well, it felt like about an hour by then. Playboy, when he later told Falwell that he'd spent 15 minutes with a whore and that he'd been... Impotent. Do you suppose he was thinking of this period when he was trying to get an erection? Han. He... <coughs> twice. By now he's getting frustrated because nothing's happening. I guess the challenge of taking somebody who didn't want to be taken is lost. He's done it. Playboy. What were you doing? Han. I cried a lot. I told him that things hurt me. I told him that... I just didn't... I, I remember tears rolling out of my eyes and I remember telling him I can't breathe. I know that he was getting frustrated because he couldn't... He was trying to find a way... Playboy. Was there any kindness? Han. No. Playboy. Did he caress you in any way? Kiss you? Han. No, no, no. He was like... What's next? It, it was like a book. Like, like getting a book and saying, Okay, we did that, that, and that. All he told me was that he really liked long hair. At that time, my hair was a little longer. I felt like... If I could have lifted my arm, I, I would have pulled his hair out. I really would have. I feel that man just felt he was getting one big free ride. He was going to get all that he could out of me. For me, for, a, for somebody who was having a first experience, this ruined my feelings. After that, I felt that making love or having sex was just a thing that caused a lot of pain, even if it was pleasing for someone else. Because it wasn't pleasing to me put a bad light on it for a long, long time. Now I realize as time goes on that's just not the way it is. Not that I'm running around sleeping with different people to find out I'm, I'm not. Though that's no one's business anyway. So as Baker was going on and on, he began to say that he wanted to do it again. He rolls me on my back and by now I'm like, I'm like well, I was on my, my stomach, okay? Nothing was happening, so he rolls me on my back again. Playboy. He was trying to enter you from behind. Han. Yeah, but... Then he puts me back on my back again, and he's telling me that he wants to see me again. He says that this is just great, and he hasn't had anything like this. I was crying and trying to tell this man that he has destroyed my life, and he said to me, well, you'll appreciate it later. After a while, he says, I really need to see you again. I was really upset. I said, what am I going to do now if I'm having a baby? What if I'm pregnant? He goes, look... All I'm telling you is, I need to see you again. I have jets, I have this, I have that. I can make any kind of arrangements. Playboy, he said, I have jets? Han, I have jets, two jets. Playboy, and where were you? Han, I was still on the bed crying and thinking about having a baby, and he said, look, I need a woman like you to be, to be by my side. I can make the arrangements. I remember him saying he had two Lear jets and that he needed to have somebody who would accommodate him fly in and be by his side, a woman who had not been around other people, somebody he could trust. Playboy. He meant a woman who hadn't slept with other men. Han, obviously. He's telling me how, how much he could use a girl like me, and I'm not responding. I'm just lying there freezing. I'm freezing, and he's on top of me. Playboy. He was on top of you while he was saying that? Han. Yeah. He's on top of me. So then he says, I really would like to try this just one more time. By now, he's telling me about jets and seeing me, but I'm thinking about babies and thinking about my pain and thinking, this is Jim Baker on top of me telling me this. This is what I'm thinking. This is, this is crazy. It's insanity. Playboy. And he wanted to do it one more time? Han. 
He's just unable, and I, I don't know even what he got out of it. I don't know how the man... <clears throat> because I don't... I, di I didn't participate. The man did what he wanted, but... He's getting a little bit frustrated now, and he's telling me that it, it doesn't matter. Maybe he has something on his mind. So he said to me, listen, I could go on, but I'm going to have to go. My daughter is with my bodyguards. Now I'm worried the girl is probably right outside. For all I know, she's really close by. So he's making all these great plans, and I'm crying. He rolls off me, and I'm so cold. I was freezing. I was ice cold. I remember pulling the blankets over me and getting up and saying, well, I've got to get to my bodyguards. But you really ministered to me, Playboy. Really ministered to me? He said that? Han. He also said it later. So he got up, brushed his hair with my hairbrush, and left. Playboy. How much time had passed? Han. About an hour, an hour and a half. At the end, he said, thanks a lot. So I'm in bed, and I... Playboy. Did he wave? Did he come back and kiss you goodbye? Han. No. He just ripped the blankets off. He knew, too, I was freezing. You know when, when you're freezing and you don't want to move? But he just said, thanks a lot. Playboy, how did you feel about that? Han, I want to tell you something. If I ever did a book, I would probably title it something about a flower. If the man had ever come back to my room ten minutes later with one lousy flower and said, Jessica, I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. I probably could have looked the other way. He probably still would have PTL. Playboy. That's a lot to forgive for a flower. Han, a flower says you're there, you're... You exist, you're human. A flower is something you can see, you can feel, you can smell. That's how I think of it. You don't give flowers to robots and machines. There's a lot behind a flower to me. Playboy. And you would have forgiven the whole thing. You'd have forgiven him for forcing himself on you. Han, I can forgive a lot, I really can. All I can tell you is that I did not initiate it. I did not want him. Playboy. The blankets had been ripped off and the guy was out the door. Did you hear voices? Han. No. I just heard the door shut. Whew. Heavy stuff. We'll conclude the Jessica Han interview in the November issue of Playboy next Saturday morning. Right after the news. Okay, we'll have to let the big people back in the room now. <clears throat> let me put out my cigarette. Okay, boys and girls, and that's all you need to know to get Mommy and Daddy lots and lots of Christmas presents. I'll give you my opinion of the guy. I think he ought to be locked up and have his thing cut off. What, Uncle Bob, who read it? You, what, what? I'm not clear here. Huh? Uh, who, who do you want to have his thing cut off? Baker. Baker? Yeah. Okay, you want to cut off Baker's thing? Yeah, I mean, it's what should be done to him. Why do you want to cut off Baker's thing? I mean, do, do you often walk around fantasizing about cutting off guys' things? Or, no, or what? but, no. you know, when he does a thing like that, and supposed to be a preacher. When he does a thing like that and you want to cut off his thing? No. You ought to have it cut off. What do you think that might accomplish? Well, uh, I don't know if it'd accomplish anything, but... I mean, suppose, for example, that Jessica Hahn was making all of this up just to get her picture in Playboy. Do you, you know, you can't sew it back on. No, it's... <laughs> you know, it'd be kind of black and then, and, oh, it'd just be all gushy and uh, mushy. But, uh... You couldn't sew it back on. No, he can't, but uh, he he should know better. I mean, if anybody else did, they'd be locked up in jail. Mm-hmm. For, for rape. Well, it would certainly appear to be rape to me. But I, I, don't, I don't know that, you know, cutting a guy's thing off would do well, much by. Well, whatever. Well, anyway, you know, he, he should be locked up. Okay. Even if it's not cut off, locked up for life. Well, minor, minor problem with that. First of all, the woman did not file rape charges, and secondly, the statute of limitations has long passed. Well, that's true, too. I agree with you there. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, he thought I meant thank you, go away. I just meant thank you for agreeing with me. Harlow. 
Huh? Before they weren't so good at fixing their cars. They were always having trouble in their tanks. I don't know. I've never gotten my car worked on no. in Russia. I was wondering, were you reading that story for uh, the thing about Jessica Hahn for Larry Flint? He's in the hospital. Does it make him feel better or make him feel worse? He didn't put the article in this uh, magazine. Was was I reading the article? Oh, Larry Flint. You know he. Uh, Which got, article? Uh, about Jessica. Hahn. Oh, I'm I'm one of the old kids. I was listening when I shouldn't. I feel naughty. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, forget about that. It's not a... Uh, I know you have a beard. Do you have a thick beard or a little beard like that? Or Well, well, Bork has more or less of a goatee than a beard. Yeah, you're true. right. It's more of a goatee. I have a full beard, although I keep it trimmed very short. It's probably yeah. not more than half well, an my inch. my grandfather...